goods and on textiles, which are poor countries' main exports. And it's a problem that uh, the countries themselves are mismanaged uh, and they have, you know, silly subsidy schemes, silly regulations, which uh, hold their people back too. Uh, but that's not putting globalization on trial. It's saying that there are uh, the lack of globalization or that there are policy, policy mistakes which uh, undermine the benefits of globalization. Uh, the case for free trade uh, is, uh, is pretty obvious, uh, and those countries that practice it do better. But it's, it's surely it's a selectively applied form of globalization that suits the rich world at the expense of the poor. Well, I mean, I mean, as I said, rich countries uh, protect some some goods and not others, and developing countries uh, can choose to be more open or not. Uh, places like, as I said, come back to South Korea, um, they had a choice. It was a very simple choice. In 1960, they were written off. They said basically, you know, this country is going nowhere. The World Bank produced a famous report saying it could see no future at all, and it made a choice. It said, well, look, rather than shut ourselves off. At the time, the, the, the prevailing model was called import substitution. You cut, cut yourself off from the world economy and try and produce everything locally. Um, and South Korea said, no, what we're going to do is we're going to export. Um, and it did, and the transformation in, in 40 years is amazing. That is what China has decided to do, and is what, for example, India, which had gone, you know, it was the, this, the leader of the import substitution model. It was saying, you know, we can produce everything within India. We're a nice big market. We can produce cars. We can produce steel. And, you know, that model went nowhere, and you saw actually uh, a desperately poor country falling further and further behind. And now that they're starting to open up, you're actually seeing all of a sudden for the first time growth in India, which is a place everyone had written off. Um, you know, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't attack globalization because governments make mistakes and because most countries haven't adopted it uh, as much as they ought to. Principally the countries of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, well, developing countries make the same mistake. You see that um, uh, the import barriers are actually higher on average in, in poor countries than they are in rich countries. Rich countries practice a very specific form of protectionism. They do it in, in farming, uh, they do it in textiles, uh, and they do it in you know, a few things like steel. Unfortunately, these happen to be uh, many of the things that poor countries export. And you know, I, I'm at one with those people who say uh, that uh, rich countries shouldn't practice that kind of protectionism. Uh, that, that, uh, that rich countries should genuinely embrace globalization to practice what they preach. I agree with that 100%. Um, and, you know, there's, there, there's, no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no gap between me and anti-globalization people on that. Do you agree with Joseph Stieglitz, the former chief economist of the World Bank, who said that uh, his argument, like yours, is that globalization properly practiced uh, can deliver prosperity, as it did in much of Asia, as you say. Uh, but he said, quite clearly, the rich countries have hijacked globalization using as weapons the IMF, the World Trade Organization, your former employer, and other international organizations that are supposed to act in the interests of all countries. And he said these institutions are all too often closely aligned with the commercial and financial interests of those in the advanced industrial countries. Was that your experience working at the WTO? Um, I think you have to be careful to distinguish, and Mr. Stiglitz is guilty of not doing so, uh, between the IMF and the WTO. The IMF uh, is clearly uh, run very, clo very tightly by the U.S. Treasury. Uh, that is not the case at the WTO. At the WTO, every country has a veto. It's one country, one vote. It's the most democratic international institution that we have. Um, and poor countries yield real clout there. Uh, that's why it's taken so long to get a new WTO round off the ground, simply because until now they were blocking it. And my experience at the WTO is that actually small countries punch above their weight, that in a system of international rules where they have a say in setting the rules, they have far, far more clout than in a, in, a, in, a, in a system based purely on power where clearly the big boys are going to decide everything. But not enough clout to challenge the things that really matter. The United States Farm Subsidies Act, which uh, was signed into law uh, recently, which uh, guarantees billions of pounds worth of subsidies for, uh, for a very small number of farmers who are quite marginal in importance in the United States economy, but the impact of that act will be devastating for millions of farmers in the third world. There's nothing that third world countries can do in the WTO to challenge that, is there? That's simply untrue. I mean, I agree that the, um, the, farm, the U.S. Farm Bill is a disaster. I think that the European Union's common agricultural policy is also a disaster. Um, and both of those things are up for negotiation at the moment in Geneva as part of the new WTO round. Now, how else, apart from through a WTO round, are we going to get rid of this protectionism? Um, it, is a, it is a target for uh, developing countries. The U.S. itself has said, you know, we've just ramped up uh, our farm protectionism, but we're willing to lower it again if we see the EU doing the same. This is only going to happen through the WTO.
But what are African countries, for example, supposed to make of this when they say, we've done everything, Mozambique, Tanzania, for example, we've done everything that Washington has asked us. We've taken away protective barriers, we've liberalized, we've privatized, we've laid people off. We've sunk many people into poverty in the expectation that things have to get worse before they get better. And then, suddenly, for uh, reasons of political expediency, what happens? George Bush signs into, act, signs into law an act which runs counter to the very, the very hymn sheet that they've been preaching to us. Yeah, and I think, first of all, that African countries which have uh, opened up to the rest of the world have seen the benefit. Uh, one place I know well is Lesotho, and Lesotho, which is a small mountainous country, uh, you would think, you know, it feels miles away from anywhere else. Thanks to globalization, they're now exporting T-shirts to the United States and Taiwanese firms who are, who are um, organizing it. That's globalization in practice, and the country is benefiting, benefiting from it. But if you, want to, if, you, if you want me to, and I don't disagree with the fact that it's, it's obscene, uh, that George Bush imposed uh, this, these huge subsidies. What I'm asking you, though, is whether the WTO provides an effective uh, arena for, cha for, for small nations to challenge that. It, 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 really does. it does, actually. I mean, the point is, is that uh, a famous case is where Costa Rica complained to the WTO because the United States was blocking its exports of underwear. And Costa Rica, which is a tiny, tiny speck of a country, won the case, and the U.S. Uh, lifted its restriction. That would only have happened that uh, could only have happened thanks to the WTO. And I said to you, the same thing applies to uh, the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is having a, a devastating effect, I agree. Uh, the only way that we're going to get rid of this protectionism is through a bargain at the WTO where the US says, OK, we'll get rid of our farm subsidies if the EU does, if Japan does, uh, and if other countries do. It's, that's the only way it's going to happen. And it's going to take decades. Uh, no, the, well, the target date for the end of uh, the current WTO round is uh, end of 2004. These things tend to run on, but we're talking about uh, much faster than any other route. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, protectionism is terrible. We can agree on that. Political lobbies uh, are, are powerful in defending their interests, clearly. But that's the beauty of the WTO, is that you agree to open your markets in return for access to others. So you can get past that deadlock, uh, and you can have a, have, have a good chance of, uh, but they've been doing it for a decade. They've been uh, liberalizing their markets for a decade. And it's only this year that a unilateralist Bush administration has uh, slapped them in the face, in effect, by, well, it's a, it's a, it, the effect is double. Not only are there massive new subsidies for farms in the United States, the very act of signing that, act, uh, that piece of legislation into law uh, has set back the cause of reform of the common agricultural policy by years, hasn't it? Well, look, you can just see that in 1950, the average tariff on uh, manufacturers was 50 percent. It's now less than four percent. Now, what is the effect of that been? Well, the effect of that been is that now you have uh, places like China, which can mass produce toys, suitcases, uh, uh, electronic goods. You see them in the shops everywhere.